you're practicing very well could be a waste of time if you're guilty of these practicing pitfalls. But not to worry, because my goal today is not to guilt you and shame you. I just want to illuminate some problems that might be going on so that you can overcome hurdles, overcome frustrations, and reach your goals on the drums. I'll even give you a practical mental exercise, a mental exercise that you can do in a physical way that you can take to the kit right now to make sure that your practicing is deep, productive, and effective. This is good stuff, so stick with me. Here we go. The quality of your practicing actually matters more than what you're practicing. In other words, you could blaze through exercises and patterns and grooves and whatever, but if you're not actively self-critiquing, if you're not actively listening to yourself and thinking, how can I make this better, then you're probably wasting your time. You're probably not growing. That's what we're getting at here, that if you're not practicing well, you're not growing, even if you're practicing the so-called right things. So my goal today is not to guilt you, make you feel guilty for these things if you're guilty of them, because I know a lot of us are, a lot of us have been. Instead, I wanna give you practical solutions. So know that that's the direction we're going here. We're gonna go through some pitfalls, some things that can be keeping you from growing, but we're gonna turn this around. Here we go. You might be wasting your practice time. Well, you are <laughs> wasting your practicing time if you're not actively critiquing your technique or practicing in front of a mirror or practicing in front of an iPad or computer screen. You know, these days, thanks to technology, even if you don't have a mirror in front of your setup to watch yourself, which is great, I think that's the best way to do it still. If you don't have that, well, you can still just set up an iPad or even your phone, any way to just at least see yourself, have some visual feedback. And of course, you can use the phone, the iPad, whatever, to then video yourself, video yourself practicing slow singles and whatever to make sure that you actually see what your hands are doing. So I did a recent survey of my email list just to ask people to get a feel for have you, are you self-taught? Are you self-taught or have you taken drum lessons consistently? And I was actually surprised to see, I don't know if this carries across my YouTube audience here, but it was true on my email list, that about the same number of people who consider themselves self-taught, no lessons, same number also had taken lessons consistently at some point in life, even if it was decades ago. So an equal number of, of folks have taken lessons, equal number have stayed totally self-taught, just learning online. And so really, even if you're in both of those camps, but especially if you're self-taught, you have to actively self-critique. You have to be watching yourself and seeing what you're doing, being aware of that. And a great way to do that is to film yourself. Film it in slow motion. I love how smartphones can do the 240 frames per second. And so you can film yourself in really nice, smooth, slow motion. Make sure you got a lot of light on your hand because you need a lot of light for doing the slow-mo. But you can go back and you can watch exactly what you're doing. And that's so helpful when you're practicing singles, when you're practicing doubles. And so do that, take advantage of that. Even if you took lessons a long time ago and you're getting back into the drums or you're taking lessons now locally, that's great. Be your own teacher still so that you're growing in the week and your time apart from your teacher. Be growing constantly. That's how you don't get stuck in ruts. That's how you don't plateau. That's how you keep growing. Number two, you might be wasting your time practicing if you're not actively practicing to a metronome. Now, I believe there's a difference between actively practicing to a metronome and passively <laughs> practicing to a metronome. And I've been guilty of the passive practice, and I think a lot of us have been, where we're like, well, my teacher's saying, or Steven's saying, practice to a metronome, so okay, turn my metronome on, practice my grooves. The metronome's there, doing its thing. It's kind of like that roommate that you don't really talk to, and they stay on their side of the room, and they keep their junk on their side of the room, and you know they're there. You, you live your life, they live their life. That's not really the way it's supposed to be. If you want to actually uh, build your time and you actually want to have good time, you have to actively pursue that. I love metaphors, and my wife makes fun of my metaphors because sometimes they're a little crazy, like this one is turning into as I'm thinking through it right now. But it's like a relationship, it's like a marriage. You have to pursue that marriage. If you're gonna have a successful marriage, you have to pursue the other person. And that's kind of the way it is between drums and a metronome where you've gotta actively be pursuing that metronome, know that it's there, be listening to yourself, be aware of what you're doing, be aware of what the metronome's doing so that you're actually linked together. Otherwise, if the metronome is off here doing its thing, even if you're with it, but you're not listening to it, you're not necessarily practicing good time. So a practical exercise you can do to help with this is play to a metronome, but have the metronome only play half notes where it's like one, two, three, four, or just downbeats, one, two, three, four. 
one. Once you've gotten to where you can play with quarter notes, just start thinning it out so that you're really having to listen to yourself. And really, honestly, the best way, the best way to practice time, especially if you're preparing for a gig, is take whatever song you're learning, whatever the song is, and make sure you know it, you've, got it, you've learned it, so that you can play it just naked by yourself. So not playing along with the recording, not playing along to a metronome, just record yourself, set up your phone, whatever, video yourself just playing through the song, just you. That's all you're hearing, and you're like singing the song in your head as you're playing, you're having fun, make the most out of it, try to have as much fun as you can when it's just you, but then go back and listen to that and see, hey, I rushed right there, or I dragged there, or eh, I didn't sound very good there. Then go back and do, it, do that again, be, being aware of what your tendencies were. That is actually more productive time practice than just playing along to a metronome over and over again, because you're finding your weaknesses and you're fixing them which is a common theme here, in case you're not catching that, that's a common theme. Be aware of your weaknesses, be actively fixing them. That's what active practice is. That's kind of what we're, what we're landing on. That's kind of our common theme here for how to make sure we're not wasting our practice time, how to make sure we're growing, we're not plateauing, and we're reaching our goals. Your practicing will be a waste of time if, number three, you're not listening to yourself. Now the previous step there about time, that's impossible if you're not listening to yourself. When you actively listen to yourself, there's that word again, actively. When you actively listen to yourself, your time, your dynamics, your kit mixing, like how you actually sound on the drums, improves. You have to actively listen. I've, I've played with too many musicians uh, who, you can tell they're, they're going through the motions, they're playing the right stuff, but they're not really locking into the groove. Things aren't tight, things aren't feeling right, or they're playing something wrong and they just literally are clueless that it's wrong because they're not really listening to themselves. They're just trying to get through the music. We've got to get out of that panic stage. We've got to get out of that place where we're just like, I just got to get through this. I got to not mess up. I got to not mess up. I got to survive. We got to get out of the survival mode. I spent too much time in that in college. I was a music performance major, had to do a lot of performing on a lot of different mallet instruments. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, like a marimba, xylophone, doing all the percussion things. And I got to a place where I was just trying to get through the piece. Same way growing up, I was playing piano and I would play piano recitals and go to competitions and stuff on piano. And I was just trying to get through the piece. It's just like, I just gotta survive this. And then once I'm done, whew, I can breathe. But the problem with that is you're doing zero listening. It's like you're just running through a tunnel and you've got this tunnel vision. You're not aware at all of what's going on around you. And you're just, you're just focused on getting to the end. And so who knows what's happening in the process. Who knows what you might be playing wrong and not realizing it. And you're also missing out a lot on the joy of actually playing music. So eventually, thankfully, I started to get into a place where I could set, sit back and listen more. That's what you've got to do. You've got to get comfortable enough with your hand technique and you've got to get to a basic level of coordination where you can play basic songs, play basic grooves, not that hard, and be able to just listen to yourself and listen to other people around you. That's, that's so important to sounding good with a band, to being a good musician, but that's crucial in your practice time because if you're not listening to yourself, nobody else is, it's just you in your practice room, you can expect the door over there to tell you that you're not playing right or the window over there to tell you fix that. You gotta be listening to yourself. You've gotta actively critique, be your own teacher, listen well, make a point to listen to what you're doing. And the, the better you get with technique, the better, the more you grow your coordination, the easier that will become. But go ahead and be putting a focus on that now, even if you're a beginner. Be thinking about what do I sound like? Record yourself all the time, because that definitely helps. Now, number four, and this is a big one. This is a crucial one that I think gets very overlooked uh, because it's very non-glamorous. But hey, on this channel, we love the non-glamorous because these are the things that I guarantee help you grow the most. So number four, you're wasting your practice time if you are not deep practicing where you're practicing something over and over again while implementing listening and self-critique. So this is a culmination of everything. This is a culmination of those last three points where we wanna be listening, we wanna be self-critiquing, and so now also we want to be patiently playing things over and over again, drilling them, like creating those new pathways in our brain, building that skill, building the comfort, building the muscle memory, the habits, so that our default is good things on the drum so that we're playing things smoothly and naturally because we've put in that repetitive practice. Real practice requires patient repetition. There's no such thing as just skimming through stuff and playing a complex coordination exercise a couple times and being like, I got it, I'm done. If you only practice things to a point where you're no longer playing it wrong, 
you're not going to excel. You've got to practice things to a point where you can't play it wrong because you know it so well, you're always playing it right. You're so confident with it. I can't remember where I heard that. That's not a quote I came up with. It was some, somebody much smarter than me said that. And yeah, it was that uh, an expert, a master at something, doesn't practice until they're no longer making mistakes. They practice until they can't make mistakes, until they know it so well that they can't help but play it near perfect every time. Of course, we're human. There's no such thing as perfection on an instrument especially. But we want to reach a level where, we're do, we're, we're, we've learned the groove so well, we've learned the coordination pattern, the hand technique, whatever it is, so well that our default is just to play it right. And that requires patient repetition. That requires active patient practicing of listening to yourself and self-critiquing. I think this is neglected because there's so many people out there, myself included, who teach you things like, hey, this is something really cool you should learn, you should work on. But sometimes what's underemphasized is how to work on that and the amount of time and repetition and focus that goes into really producing results. You've got to be patient with yourself. Learning the drums is not easy. I mean, learning basics can be easy. Drums are an easy instrument to get going with. And so that's why it's a fun instrument for young kids because you can get going and start playing basic stuff pretty quickly. But in order to sound good, in order to really play songs, in order to excel at it and become a musician on the drums, not just a drummer, but a musician, you have to be utilizing this deep practicing. You have to be sitting there and really listening to yourself and getting into this zone of just playing stuff until you're so comfortable with it that you can't play it wrong. That's it. That's it. I believe in you. I believe you can do that. If you feel like, if you feel like, man, nothing feels right behind the drums. I never feel like I'm in that comfort zone. I don't feel like I'm one with my instrument the way I ought to be. That's it. That's the answer. I mean, there's, it's not complicated. There's no secrets to this. That's how you get to that level of comfort where you're just playing and you can be listening to this over here and looking at this while thinking about this while you're still sounding good because you've put in hours of focused, repetitive practice, making sure that you're so comfortable playing something that you can't possibly mess it up. Yes, it takes patience. Yes, it takes self-discipline. And yes, it takes motivation, the curiosity of how can I do this? How can I excel at this? and deciding, I'm gonna do this. I can't do that for you. I'm hoping that I'm motivating you. I hope I'm encouraging you. I hope that you believe me when I say you can do this. Drumming is way more about work ethic than it is talent. You can do this, believe me. Even if you don't believe in yourself, I believe in you because I've seen student after student learn these things even when they feel like they don't have talent. I guess talent can be a thing. I think everybody has certain levels of curiosity or inspiration to learn different things. And when that curiosity and that inspiration meets the right resources and the self-discipline, that's where the skill comes from. So it's not like you're just born or not born with talent. If you feel like you're not talented, welcome to the club. I mean, nobody's just born doing these things. Nobody's born practicing well and playing with good time. These are things that you have to work on. And so if you're curious and you're motivated, you're like, I want to do this. You've got the resources. I hope this channel is a great resource. Then there you go. That's all there is to it. It just takes time, it takes focus, it takes patience. Whatever happened to making this video short? Okay, just a couple final thoughts I wanna leave you with here before we wrap up. In order to master something, you must be fully aware of what each limb is doing at all times. And that's something that really comes into play when you're working on coordination. You have to be fully aware of how loud your right hand is playing and what the pattern is that your right foot is playing. Once you can reach that point in your practicing, which comes from the deep practice, which comes from the repetitive practice, then that's where you master things. In order to do that, you have to practice slowly. And as a matter of fact, practicing slowly often exposes your inability to process what each limb is doing. A lot of times you get to a place where you can play fast stuff and like, yeah, I got this groove together, it's sounding good. Then you slow it down and it falls apart. Why is that? Well, it's because you don't really know it. You haven't really mastered it to a point where you're in control of what you're playing. Once you've really mastered it where you're fully in control, that means you can manipulate it that means you can improvise on it, you can change it around because now you know what you're doing. That's a really great place to be and it all comes from that intentional listening. Uh, I, I have a blog, I don't know if you knew the non glamorous Drummer has a blog, I'll link it below and I send these out to my, my email list weekly. And so there's a, a blog article about a gong solo that a friend of mine played in college and it's very interesting. Uh, it's literally a solo, it's like a cymbal roll. It's like an entire piece of music consisting of a cymbal roll but on a big gong. And a lot of these principles of listening uh, ring true with that. So go check that out because it's very interesting. It's very fascinating and mind-blowing to me. So that's in the description if you want to check that out. 
So active practicing, active practicing, that sums this up. When you practice actively, where you are focused and aware of what you're doing and you're not just going through the motions, you're not just following some steps and checking boxes, you're gonna grow. Now we kind of hinted on some hand technique today. We also got a little into some coordination. But as far as the hand technique goes, I don't want that to be like a mystical thing. I want you to know how to grip the stick. I want you to know how to get rebound because that translates to everything else you ever play on the kit. So go download my new guide, free PDF e-guide in the description called the Fast Fluid Hands Checklist. It's really cool because it's simple and we just go through four steps, starting with exactly how to grip the stick to get a whole bunch of notes in one stroke and how we can manipulate the fingers, the finger motion in order to get lots of looseness and rebound and eventually speed. Uh, it's a really cool, very helpful guy that I just felt like I needed to make and throw out there for you guys because this is such a need, such a core need in the online drumming community and especially with this non-glamorous community here. And so I don't want that to be neglected. So go check that out if I've got a list of everything that this is gonna help you do because I really believe in this method and it's it's gonna get you results if you go download it. It's a total no-brainer to go download it, get it on your iPad, take it to your practice room. It's gonna make sure you're holding your sticks the right way to begin with. If you've never taken lessons, make sure you're holding your sticks right. Eliminate the weak hand, no more weak hand. Play evenly hand-to-hand -hand so that you're able to play with better facility around the kit without having to worry about a clumsy, often left hand that's slowing you down. It's gonna help you with that. It's gonna help you use the power of your fingers to build speed and control. That's great, you're gonna learn how to do this kind of thing with your fingers. That way you can move more quickly and that way you can actually play more loosely. Fingers come into utilizing rebound. They're actually a key part of that, which is very important. You'll also be able to play your favorite songs with ease, fluidly navigating around the kit. That's the end goal for so many of us. We just wanna play songs. We just wanna play songs well and play with a band. And in order to do that, we've gotta get the hand technique squared away. Hand technique is a means to an end. And so by working through this guide, it's gonna give you all the core exact steps that you need to know. It's also loaded with photos, like sports photography style photos of my hand as I'm playing. I did a bunch of quick shots so you could see exactly what my hand is doing at different points. Plus there are links throughout the guide, uh, links embedded in the PDF uh, that take you to exclusive slow motion footage. The only way to access the slow motion footage is through the guide. So you can see me doing in slow motion all the different things that we're teaching throughout the guide extremely helpful. I want you to excel at this because I, I know from my experience and from working one-on-one -on -one with students that you cannot master the drums. You cannot excel at anything on the drums until you get your hand technique under control and you get that loose rebound happening. So check out the guide. It's free. Go get it. All right. Thanks for watching. As always, everyone, I appreciate you spending time with me here today seeking out more resources and good information on the drums. I love that you're curious and that you've stuck with me and that you're working to implement these things that you're learning so that you become a better drummer. It's the non-glamorous skills that go the longest way when you're learning. It's not the flashy stick tricks, the gimmicky things, the, the licks. That's only gonna serve you so long, but these core things, they're gonna serve you for a lifetime of drumming. So if you take the initiative, you take action and you implement these things, you follow these steps, you download the guide, I guarantee you, you're gonna grow. I'm excited for you. You can do this, I believe in you. So stay non-glamorous, practice in that non-glamorous, focused, active way. You're gonna get results. Keep at it, work hard, practice hard, but practice the right way. Thanks everyone, I'll see you on the next video.